So, last week we were speaking about being, having deliberation and being certain about things before acting. And it was in specific, the specific context was talking about the new sexual and relationship education in schools. And it was interesting actually, on Facebook, the sort of discussions that people were having, it was about, in fact, in certain areas, these things are not taking place, or that, that the schools are taken into consideration if there's a large, a larger population of Muslims in the school and so forth. So the first lesson from that is just to find out what's going on before we even act, because as I said, Muslims, we've got good hearts, but sometimes we don't use this. <laughs> so our hearts are, are there, but sometimes we don't use our intellect. So that's very important. And the Prophet Sallallahu highlighted this in many of his interactions with people. And also Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, demonstrates this in one of the most beautiful verses um, that touches on this topic in Surah Al-Fatih. In Surah Al-Fat, which is Surah 48, verse 25, he says, هُمُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَصَدُّوهُمْ عَنِ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ Those are the ones who have disbelieved, who knowing, and the context here, they knowingly know, that they, know they knowingly, uh, they have knowledge that they are in the wrong. Because the context of this is Hudaybiyah. So the people of Mecca, they are stopping the Muslims from performing, performing the Umrah. And they know that this is wrong. And all the, even the, what's so interesting about this story, we can learn so much, is that the, all the Arab tribes who weren't Muslim around the Quraysh were saying, you shouldn't be doing this. But they, their, their hamiyyah, as Allah describes it, their hot fervent izzat, basically, would not, would have prevented them from acting appropriately. So he says, these are the people who have disbelieved and was saddukum al masjid haram and block you from entering the sacred mosque, the holy sanctuary, where <coughs> and prevented you from um, from offering your sacrifices, which was something that was incredibly sacred in their culture, was that if someone comes forward to give an offering of animals in sacrifice to the holy house, no one would stop you. And that's why they used to put gardens, as you go at Lahar, they used to put these around the animals to demonstrate that these things are sacred and blessed and we you should let us put. Um, we should, you let, should let us continue and pass on in order to give these offerings. Why? Because these offerings, who were they offered to? The poor people and the needy. And so even if you have rancor or hatred in your heart towards someone, if you know they've come for a righteous purpose, not to block them off. And he said, and you have a, for, the, for these, those sacrificial animals to reach their place where they can be sacrificed. Then Allah says, so look, it's really important here. In this verse, he's saying these people have done like grave wrong. So you are perfectly entitled to act against them and to stand up against them and wage war against them, even though it's like a sacred house. This is what Allah's saying. But then he gets him to think. So the first, the beginning of the verse, sort of incites them to take action because the the the, the aggressor is acting wrongfully. And then he says, When he says, But if it were not for believing men and believing women who you had no knowledge of, and thus you would trample on them. So the context here is that within Mecca, there are believing men and believing women and children who are keeping their faith secret. So if you wage war against the people of Mecca now and fight them, many, many people who are innocent, and not only that, many people who are believers, you'll end up killing them without even having any knowledge about that. And then Allah says, فَتُصِيبُكُمْ مِنْهُمْ مَعَرَّةٌ بِغَيْعِينَ And thus you will be afflicted by a sin without any knowledge of it. And this is really important for the, in terms of Islamic principles, is that if we know people who are innocent are going to be affected, it doesn't matter whether you're in the right or the wrong, you have to prevent any sort of harm happening to these people. And in modern war, this is something completely oblivious to people. They say they were, what, what's the term they used? Uh, collateral. Collateral damage. <laughs> As if that justifies it. Yes. <laughs> But the, in Islam, we say there's risks to innocent people's lives, we hold out, regardless of whether we're justified or not. And this is a proof of this, this verse. 
And ma'amra is a beautiful word because ma'amra it has many meanings, but one of the meanings is it's like it says it, the boils on a neck. So yeah, naturally a neck is beautiful, isn't it? And they talk about the, the neck of a camel, very elegant, but it's got boils on it. So the the context here is that you're doing something beautiful, but it's marred and it's spoiled. And so they were going to do something that was righteous, to stand up for their faith and defend themselves in the right. But if by doing so you cause atrocities, then you've scarred and ruined your whole, uh, the, you know, your whole mission. And this is a huge lesson for us as Muslims, is that we may be entirely justified, but if it means mar in our name, then we have to hold back, because we have to look at the broader picture. And if you think about it, belief in God is about, what's the, what's the principle, or what's the greatest benefit of believing in God? is that you can, you can broaden your horizons and look from a high perspective because you realize that you don't know and there's someone who does. That's a fundamentally that you have a belief in a higher power is a belief that your, our intellect is limited and we there may be some pieces of the puzzle that we're not aware of. And so as religious people we have to personify that. It says, man, in, in order, so Allah made you hold back from attacking them because Allah wishes to enter into his compassion and his mercy, whoever he wishes. So he knows what's going on, you don't. If they were separate, if we were, if we were able to distinguish between those who were innocent and those weren't, we would have allowed you, we would, we would have punished them at your hand. But he, this wasn't the case. So, <coughs> we see that having deliberation and holding back, even when we feel we're justified, is a very, very important quality of the believer. There's another beautiful demonstration of this in the Hadith of Bukhari, where a group, an entourage of people, came to visit the Prophet so that from these like neighbor, you know, the tribes from outside of Medina. They came in order to pledge their allegiance to him, and the, when they arrived at the gates of or when they arrived at the, the, the boundaries of the city, most of the, most of the men, what did they do? They rushed to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi directly out of their fervor and passion and ishq uh, for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then one man stayed back, and this man's name was al Ashesh. the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam named him this. And he stayed back and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked the men, where's your leader? And he says, he stayed back. And what's really interesting was, this man was the youngest of the tribe. And you'd assume that the leader would be the? The eldest. And he was at the youngest. Why? Because they, they, <coughs> they, they, they noticed in him and recognized in him qualities that made him a leader. And he said, he said, oh, he stayed back in order to tie our camels up and our steeds up, make sure all our provisions are s sorted. And also, he performed, he changed his clothing and performed a, a ghusl, a wash, in, before meeting the Prophet ﷺ. So when this man eventually came to see the Prophet ﷺ, he honored him and he said, you have two qualities in you that are beloved to Allah and his messenger. And he said, what's that? He said, the first one, al-hilm. Al-hilm is the, is the maturity to control your emotions. Hilm is at where you, you basically are, are composed, it's composure. And then he says, ana, 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 or in another narration, um, is this deliberation. Deliberation, I, you think about your mood, you take things, you're precautionary about the way you act, and you take your time and think through. Then the man said, because what did this man do? This man took his time and wanted to meet the Prophet in his best of states. Whilst the others couldn't control their, their love and their fervor in order to meet the Prophet directly. And then he said something very interesting, this man to the Prophet He said, is this quality something that's inbuilt in me, i.e. I've been born with, or is it something that I've acquired, that I've worked on? He said, this is a quality Allah has created you upon. So this shows also that people are of different dispositions and temperaments. So some people are calm by nature, and other people are a bit more hot-headed. And we see this in many examples in the, light, in, the, in the companions. Some who are of a fiery nature. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu obviously comes to mind. People who are a lot more karma, like Sayyidina Uthman. He was known as being very shy and very deliberate. And so, and each person, their temperament is a blessing in its place, but also a test and a trial for them in other places. And this is really what I want to highlight today. 
And so the man said, Ashaj, he said, uh, he says, praise be to the one who is in, he has granted me these natural qualities that are beloved to him and beloved to his messenger. And just, you know, uh, just touching on a, on a small point, I don't really see this as very relevant, but I may be wrong, is that some people wanted me to touch upon what happened this week, you know, the WhatsApp messages about the guy in Keithley, if anyone was highlighted that anyone saw that, is that there's this, uh, Keith, this man, uh, brother from Keithwell, he's left the thing, but he became a Christian and he started uh, pro uh, propagating Christianity amongst the vulnerable, amongst the community, and everyone got really hot-headed about this. And the reality is, like, that's, this is the problem with social media, is that things are made out bigger than they are. I mean, you have to ask, the, the, whoever's saying in Arabic is, ask the people of Mecca, they have more knowledge about, uh, you know, their, their valleys. Ask the people of Keithley, you know, this person is very, like, irrelevant, really. The poor guy, he's been out of prison for many days, he's been out of prison. He wasn't mentally all there, very vulnerable, he's been through things. And he, was, and he ended up, like, and the people who he was actually... Uh, converting to Christianity, you could tell they had mental illness. You know, it was very clear when you saw the shower scene. It was very, you know, the baptism in the shower. First of all, people were saying, "How can you do it? It's like a shahad in the, in the toilet, stuff for the one for Christians." So the reality is, these things are very irrelevant. Honestly, when you the, the important thing is, we see stuff, we go, oh, "Oh, look at this!" You know, we get all passionate. You have to think. I saw straight away that, come on, man, this is not anything a big issue whatsoever. And the thing is, people want a reaction. And so when people want a reaction, what's the best thing to do? You just say, look, let's step back, let's get a bit of clarity on the issue beforehand and find out what's going on before we get all hot about things. And so the topic of today is about anger. And anger is a really interesting quality, I say. You say quality, anger's not a quality. In fact, anger is part of our very essence. And it's in our nature to be angry. Uh, I've got a quote here saying, anger is only an energy that's fierce and powerful, and it's in the body. Anger is not a sin or an unspiritual force. It doesn't make you unspiritual if you have anger. And it can't be eradicated. But rather, that anger, if used correctly, is creative. And it's a raw part of us waiting to be met with understanding. And the Prophet recognized this, that anger has to be dealt with in a, in a deliberate way and in a mature way. It's not something we can remove from us. And the problem is if people try to remove their anger, it's actually counterproductive because it ends up either whatever you resist persists. If you try to resist your anger and say, I shouldn't be angry, i.e. I'm talking long term, you cause yourself more harm. Yes, we are called, when the anger comes, not to act out upon it. And the Prophet وسلم, uh, sorry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the quality, those people who have that quality. He says, <laughs> Those who spend forth in times of ease and in times of difficult times, when they don't have, they still spend. <laughs> and they literally, they swallow their anger. So when it comes, you go, Ooh, like this. But... That's a short-term solution. That means you don't act when the, you want to basically lash out at the person. Because you realize, as we've mentioned in the Quranic verse, that you may end up regretting what you've done. When when nas and those who pardon people, Allah yuhibbun muhsinin, and Allah loves the good doers. So yes, we require some of us to swallow that anger, but it doesn't mean that that's going to eradicate that anger. So we have to direct, notice what that anger is and direct it. And people have three dispositions. There are some people who are called to anger in most situations. And that's actually blameworthy. And I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. Someone's walking down the street and, a, and this guy just elbows his wife and says, you, you know, you packies, basically, and says something racist to them. And you, and you start just, no, 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 it's all right, I didn't mean that, or so forth. This is considered a weakness. Because you're, at that point, you're, you need to demonstrate your anger in a controlled way. You say, don't, don't, don't you do that, and you stand up, and you defend yourself and honour your wife or honour your children or whoever. This is actually considered a weakness. And so those people who have that sense of that weakness, they're called upon to actually work on their anger. And what often happens is that people are like that, it's because in youth, they were asked to completely suppress their anger, suppress their anger, suppress their anger, until basically they become completely placid. And you see people like that walking around and like, this and they don't really have any 
determinism is about that. <coughs> a determination. So those people need to work on their anger in a controlled way. And what's a good example, what's a good way to do that? For example, doing a martial art and training to bring up that energy but in a controlled fashion where you don't cause harm to others but you, 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 you feel that power, you feel that anger and use it in the right way. Then there's the third, second type of person who's very balanced, he's able to demonstrate anger when he needs to and he's able to be clement and controlled when he needs to. And of course the third type of person, who is he? He's the person that can't control his anger, he's explosive. And so this is really who the Prophet spoke to because this was a very common quality in the Arabs. They're explosive characters and they stood up for their honour. So the Prophet very often needed to try to temper this in them. Imam Ghazali has a very interesting quote about anger. He says, it's not the aim of spiritual dis discipline to, to eradicate the infuriation of the heart. He says, spirituality is not eradicating anger from your heart. What it aims at is to make one disobey anger and not use it except within those limits, praiseworthy in the sacred law. So we ask ourselves, how do I use this anger that I have in a productive way that's not going to bring shame and dishonour on myself, on my family, and my friends, and my community, but rather in a way that brings about a desired result. And it needs to be favoured by reason. As for suppressing the root of infuriation, that fire inside, which originates in the heart, so it's part of our nature. This is not possible, for it does not turn it, for it, for it does not, uh, sorry, he's, he who tends towards slackness where he feels his fervor, his hamia, is weak and ought to treat himself until his anger becomes stronger, like I was saying. As he whose anger tends towards excessiveness to the extent that leads him to recklessness and immorality, he ought to treat himself to a reduction in the assault of anger. So he, he, he needs to work on it. So we recognize that anger is a normal quality, but how do we use it? And the Prophet وسلم, many of us are familiar with the ways that he did this. What's, what's a simple way the Prophet وسلم, told us to address our anger? He said to say what? A'udhu <laughs> Billahi in a shaitan, in a regime. To remind, and this is beautiful because Allah, uh, the Prophet is, remi is reminding us that this, this thing we're feeling, we, it's not something that, we, that overwhelms us, rather it's an external force that we need to control. And we do that by seeking protection in someone bigger than us. Who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we throw it out to someone who can handle it, if we can't handle it, and realize there's something broader, that someone broader and more powerful that we can turn to, to control this. And also, when you say that, when the anger comes, and you say, you're catching it. And what usually, what happens with anger? You don't, you, can't, you don't even have time to think. So it, boom, it catches you. Before you know it, you regret what you've done. The Prophet of them, all the methods that he used, such as making wudu, such as sitting down, such as saying, I'm going to do the they're all different methods in order to catch, like the very, you know, the tr very trigger to grab it before it comes. So that when you say this thing, you've taken that moment out and you've stood, you've stood back from the anger and then you've, you ask yourself how to deal with this. And there's many different ways we can do this. One is, to re what the one is to tune into your body. What is this as a sensation, this anger? It's a fire here. The moment you ask yourself, and this is to be practiced even when you're not experiencing anger, or you're feeling just the, the first kindling of the anger, you say, where am I feeling that? And you touch into it, and then you tune into your feet. Because your feet are connected to the earth, that something is far bigger than you. It's beautiful, this exercise, because you realise there's something that's holding me far bigger than me. And that, that takes us to realise who's holding us, who's bigger than us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, before, when you feel those first sparks of anger, you tune straight to your feet in the contact of the floor as if the floor's holding you up. And then you realise, I can contain this. That's the first step. And the Prophet Sallallahu recognises. He gave methods for his people in order to take a moment out and realise that I can contain this anger. And so, what we've learned today is that anger is a natural quality, but if we, don't, if we act upon it impulsively, without thinking about things, we will end up regretting what we do, we do and we end up wronging other people who aren't even responsible. How often when we felt anger, and then like for example, someone says something, and you turn around and you're really angry, you've got red in your face, and you find out it's just a little five-year-old kid, and he was saying it to his mate, and your anger suddenly drops straight away. 
because you realise what you thought was the case is not the case. And so that's just panning out and seeing things from a bigger picture. And so it's about taking that time out. What's the right thing to do? And if we don't, we will end up hurting ourselves, hurting the people around us, and then we will end up having regret about those things. And that goes back to the verse that we were talking about, that you will be afflicted by shame and sin without any knowledge of it. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to grant us wisdom and the hidden, this clemency, this ability to control our emotions in a mature fashion and channel, channel them in a way that brings about benefit for us and our communities and our afterlife and our well-being. Amen.